What I'm going to talk about today is the way that the combination of uh, a revolution, I would suggest, in the behavioural sciences and our understanding of what it is to be human is uh, combining with that uh, exponential increase in the amount of data available on each and every one of us um, with machine learning for um, online and offline manipulation. Uh, that gives you an overview of what I'm going to cover. I'm going to start with the nature of warfare. Uh, there's been a lot of talk about that both on my side of the pond but also on yours. Uh, then I'm going to try and convince you all that you are just data. Uh, and uh, after that, I'll uh, talk a little bit about what I think all that means for warfare now and, and in the future. Talking about how I think it's going to drive intelligence officers like me uh, off the stage and humans, uh, operators, increasingly out of the loop in decision making. And finishing up the day with something that I find really interesting, which is AI in strategy and potentially AI also in, uh, in, in, at the operational and tactical level and how that might lead to uh, what, what I'm calling and others are calling otherworldly moves. And I leave that as a, as a hook to hopefully keep you interested to the end. So many of you will be aware that um, General Mattis has mused a few times now that he thinks the increasing application of artificial intelligence in warfare is changing the nature of warfare. Um, Similarly, your former Secretary um, uh, State, of State for Defence, Bob Work, has made uh, statements to the same end. And recently, our Defence Concepts and Doctrine Centre, where I spend quite a bit of my time, published a document called Global Strategic Trends, which also said uh, the application of artificial intelligence to war uh, might be changing the nature of warfare. We're a little more conservative than you guys on our side of the pond. So uh, I am going to argue that I don't think it is. I think the nature of warfare is, as we're all taught in Staff College, enduring. But I do think it is shaking up the character of warfare, forcing us to engage with the nature of warfare in a way that we perhaps have never done, and certainly not in the totality that we've needed to. I'm going to argue that the application of artificial intelligence, big data and behavioural economics or behavioural uh, psychology, behavioural sciences, to warfare is changing the character of conflict uh, in, in ways that many of us are only just beginning to understand. Now, up on the slide, we have Clausewitz. Any good staff officers amongst you will know uh, that Clausewitz said that war is merely the continuation of policy by other means. I highlight a further statement in, uh, that he makes on that same page, which is he argued that it was a continuation of political intercourse carried on with other means. Um, and the reason I think that's important is what he's talking about is that warfare is fundamentally persuasive. It's about getting a group or an individual to do something different to that which they were doing before. Just as in politics, you wish to change a policy, you wish to get a group to do something differently, you wish the world to be different to how it was before. So when we apply physical violence in warfare, we're trying to do the same thing. Now, I think that's summed up even better by Thomas Schelling, and so I put his quote below it. He says that violence is only purpose unless sport or revenge must be to influence somebody's behaviour, to coerce his decision or choice. That is, again, warfare fundamentally persuasive. It is about getting a group or an individual leader to change their minds, to do something, perhaps to withdraw from territory, to take their troops back from overseas, to change a policy that you deeply dislike. And you use violence to achieve the same thing. Now, if you accept that premise, and it's the first one that I'll build, if you accept that premise, that war is about a behavioral outcome, then it's necessary that you accept that it's, it is dependent upon a psychological effect, a cognitive effect. It's about influencing what goes on in here. Now, you can, if you disagree with the premise, take me on at the end. But if you, if you accept that premise from Klaus Fitz and Schelling and um, the idea that it's about a behavioral outcome, then you accept that psychology plays a crucial warfare, a role in warfare. And therefore, I would argue and have argued now for about five years that it, it must play a much greater role in our tactical, operational and strategic planning. And that's what we're going to come on to um, as we go on through the slides. Uh, before we get there, we need to establish a few more premises. And the first is that I'm going to argue you are just data. Now, first of all, let's think about what we mean when we talk about um, intelligence. What we mean is that in simple single-celled organisms, if you were to look at those, they move around more or less randomly. Um, they don't respond particularly to inputs or outputs, and they combine and recombine in different ways. But if we accept the theory of evolution, what we see is that those single-celled organisms, again, begin to bind together to become ever more complex organisms. Now, taking a jump down the phylogenetic tree, because you don't want me to go through evolution from the beginning of time to the present, uh, we'll start with the simple jellyfish to make the point that I wish to make. Jellyfishes don't have a brain in the way that you or I do. They have a, a distributed information processing system. And they take uh, simple inputs, like the increased salinity of the water, uh, change in the temperature, or perhaps what other jellyfish are doing, or change in the direction of light. A simple input, 
And then there's a computational layer that goes on outside, uh, inside the jellyfish. And then there's an output in terms of a change of behavior. They swim in that direction or this direction or they eat or whatever. So it's input, computational layer, and output. Now scale that up to human beings, and we are extremely similar. We too take an input, we have a computational layer, and then it leads to an output. And in the 150 years since Charles Darwin wrote The Origin of the Species, we, the, the human and life sciences have increasingly converged on the idea that humans, and indeed all life, is just bio, we are just biochemical algorithms, processing through electrochemical signals in the brain, inputs, a computational layer, and having a given output. And the reason that's so important is that the sheer volume on data available on, to, on us at the moment is meaning we can understand human behavior in unprecedented ways. Indeed, uh, Peter Watson's brilliant recent book, Convergence, talks about how uh, the sciences are converging, such that we've always known you couldn't understand physics without reference to maths, you couldn't understand uh, chemistry without reference to physics and maths, and you couldn't understand biology without reference to chemistry, physics, and maths. But we've moved beyond that now, such that in the medical sciences division at Oxford University, or indeed anywhere else, you cannot understand the medical condition without reference to chemistry, biology, chemistry, physics, and maths. And indeed, the advent of the social sciences is specifically, specifically to apply the quantitative sciences to understanding things like history and human behaviour in, in other ways. It's about applying quantitative sciences to understanding human behaviour. If you take my own field of cognitive psychology, what I might do, for example, is divide this room up 50-50. Uh, I would put you all through testing booths in which all of the conditions were the same in each, and I might vary one single variable for, uh, say, this group, which we'll call group B, compared to this group, which we'll call group A. Now, in my research, that will be some sort of surveillance queue. Perhaps there'll be a camera. And then at the end, what I will do is I will apply some maths to try to... I'll have given you all the same inputs on one side, varied just one thing on the other side. I'll apply some maths, some statistics, a, a computational layer to work out what went on in the middle. And then I'll say, hey, OK, given all your outputs, is there a statistically significant difference between those groups? And I'm building a probabilistic model of human behavior that says, actually, when we had the camera there, these guys were uh, consi consistently more generous, for example, than these people over here. Or they were consistently less antisocial than this group over here. What I'm doing is drawing inferences building probab probabilistic models of human behavior. And then I'm using that to say, OK, uh, what might happen if we were to put a camera up in, uh, in a car park or in a, a shopping center or, or a cameras up around our bases? What might be the effect on human behavior of surveilling those people? Now, that's just my research. The crucial thing is that understanding of humans as biochemical algorithms, understanding that I ha you have a given input, it leads to a given output, and I can use maths to work out in between, the stati draw statistical probabilistic inferences about what other people will do in the future. Now, many of you have heard of Kahneman and Tversky. They've been touched on throughout the day. System one and system two. System one thinking um, being that which is fast. Uh, it works well in, uh, when information is uh, low resolution, low frequency. Um, and it, but it works through heuristics, rules of thumb, simple guides to what you should do in, in given situations, whereas system two is deliberative, we don't use it very much. Um, and it, uh, it's what we use when we're doing hard problems, like perhaps you're sat at home uh, working on some, particularly in my case, some statistically di difficult statistical problem that you've got to solve. It, it's effortful and we don't use it very often. Now, what Kahneman Sversky's brilliance was to show that we make probabilistic, predictable errors that can be gained. And, and people have drawn that out earlier on. So I shan't dwell overly on that. But the, the point is that these are probabilistically predictable, replicable errors that can therefore be exploited. Now, where Kahneman won his Nobel Prize in, I think, 2001 uh, for this system one and two thinking, this understanding of cognitive biases. You've seen this slide earlier. This is, um, there's over 180 different cognitive biases listed on here. What, what Richard Thaler and Cass Sunstein did was to show the way in which these things could be used to improve human behavior. Many of you will be familiar with their book, Nudge. Um, in the UK, we have something that's popularly known as the Nudge Unit, uh, more properly as the Behavioural Insights Team. And what they do, and have been doing all over the world, is teaching governments how you take these, um, these cognitive biases, these probabilistic, predictable errors that Kahneman and Tversky showed humans make that um, increasingly we understand characterise human behaviour, and showing governments how they could exploit them to improve things. So let me give you a couple of examples. In London, for example, we uh, have had for a few years now a problem with knife crime. And one of the things they used to do was advertise the statistics to say, you know, 60% of uh, whatever, the, the crime has gone up by this amount in this area, it's gone up by that amount in that area. Increasingly, we don't do that. We have posters saying things like 90% of young people don't commit violent crime. And the reason for that is because people tend to herding behavior, as you've heard earlier, group behavior. 
it discourages people from wishing to, it makes it seem like the social norm is not to use knives and it leads to a decrease in knife crime where we apply that science effectively. Another example from the Behavioural Insights team last year was dealing with the problem of the overprescription of, of antibiotics. They wrote letters to all of the GPs across the UK that we knew were overprescribing and they said, hey, this is the average level of prescription. And 12 months later, they looked at the data and they saw there were 70,000 less prescriptions from those doctors of antibiotics. And it was a statistically significant difference. Why? Because they'd exploited one of those probabilistic predictable errors again. They knew that if they anchored those doctors to a particular number, a, a lower number, it was likely that their own prescriptions would reduce to be around it. That herd behaviours would mean that it would exert a subconscious influence, likely leading to lower prescriptions. And, and you have to think that doctors are not issuing those prescriptions before because they want it, just because they fancied it. They were doing it because they thought there was a medical need. And yet this subconscious nudge over 12 months is enough to change their behaviour. The amount of data available on us means that we all live, I would suggest, in a modern day panopticon, a world in which there is more data available on us than there has ever been before, in which, which we're watched more closely than we ever have been before. It's estimated that by 2020, there'll be something like 5,200 gigabytes of data on every person on the planet. Now, remember that that's an average. If you gave me as an intelligence officer 5,200 gigabytes of data on, every, on any person, that's, that works out to about 18.5 million books, and I couldn't make some useful prediction about your uh, future behavior, I probably shouldn't have a job. What that's going to mean is unprecedented insight. Um, what you have there is a, a quote from Dylan Curran, who if you don't follow on Twitter, I'd suggest you should, uh, who's often exposing the sheer amounts of data that the major media companies have on it. And you can see every Google ad, every app. It's estimated, for example, that Facebook knows where every 1.94 billion uh, of its users live, work, sleep, who they associate with. Of course, they know what they like, what they dislike. And it allows unprecedented inferences to be made about your behavior. What are they doing? They're measuring those behavioural inputs and then they're looking at, at the way in which behaviour changes and one of the things they, that can therefore be done is to manipulate that. So for example, uh, from movement patterns from Google Maps data, uh, it's been suggested that you might be able to pre predict early, the early onset of Alzheimer's. From the way that you type on a keyboard, it's been estimated that that input allows us to draw some statistical inferences to suggest when people might have Parkinson's. These are diagnoses of cognitive conditions, but it shows the way that inputs can be used to uh, you give somebody an input, take an input from somebody, look at their behaviour, and try to probabilistically predict what they might do in the future. Now, um, much of this data is available at open source. What you see here uh, is Tower Data and Excel and a, num a number of other companies um, whose data was purchased by um, Cambridge Analytica and used uh, to model human behaviour again on an unprecedented scale. Just to give you an idea of quite how much data there is available that can be bought from data brokers at open source, Exalate claimed to have um, it came to be able to give people your cus uh, at their customers. Um, data on individuals' age, sex, ethnicity, marital status, profession, consumer interest, offline purchasing data. Um, and if you look at tower data, they claim to have all of that, plus 80% of uh, US email addresses, everything Exalate has, your income, whether you have children, your postal address, your education, your telephone number, your homeowner status, your length of residence, and much more. So what? Well, what Cambridge Analytica are able to do is take the science that I described, the understanding of humans as biochemical algorithms, take that huge volume of data that was available and begin to use it to model human behaviour in new and fascinating ways. The guy on the top left, many of you will be familiar with, that's Alexander Nix. Uh, Nick's Nick, what Nick says he did, you can watch the videos of him describing it on uh, YouTube, is he took Facebook data and he used it to build models, um, psychometric models of all of those people whose data he had. Um, he used the ocean model, it's a well-known personality measure in psychology, and what he did using Facebook data was build a personality profile on every single person who he had data on. Um, and that measures your openness, conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness, neuroticism. So it's using the, your Facebook likes as a proxy for you filling out a um, psychometric questionnaire. Now, there's some limitations to this. Uh, it's only, uh, what I'm going to talk about was only using a 10-item questionnaire for comparison. But they were able to show that with 10 likes, uh, they were able to make better predictions about who you are and what you might do than a co-worker. And, 150 likes and that was better than a friend or cohabitant and 300 likes and it was better than a spouse. So now they're able to predict um, your some of your behaviours, some of your personality dimensions based on Facebook data better than people that know you very, very well. 
Not only that, it, the, these estimates, these psychometric models, had higher external validity in predicting life outcomes from whether you would be vulnerable to substance abuse, uh, your political attitudes, or your physical health than, uh, than the psychometric measures alone, and again, than those co-workers, spouses, and others, depending on the volume of likes that they had on you. Sometimes these things were even better than self-rated pers personality services. You fill out the questionnaire yourself, you make th that allows people to um, make predictions about what you might do, and you compare that to predictions made using those inputs that you provided to social media, whether it be, in this case, Facebook data and likes, but whether that be the way you move, the way you talk, the way you type. Remarkable insights. Now, what's that, what that has enabled is personalized propaganda and weaponized experimentation. There's, there's nothing classified about this slide, of course. It's drawn from uh, Netflix's blog, and it shows the way in which your, um, your behavioral patterns on, on Netflix, in this case, allows shows to be presented to you. Everybody knows this, that you get shows presented to you. You know, you watch this, therefore you might like this. But also allows you to build a psychometric model to say, OK, well, Keith has this kind of personality based on the fact that he watches these programs. Much in the way that Facebook um, and Cambridge Analytica can build models of your um, personality, much like you filling out a, a personality questionnaire based on what you like and don't like. So you can do this using, um, using my, what you might watch through Netflix. But they go further than that. They also design the images that they present to you uh, around your personality. So not only do you get the show presented that you might like, like in this case it says, hey Keith, you might like Stranger Things, um, and, uh, and then they then pick the image that they think most closely tallies with your personality model, the one that you are most likely to click through. And then what they do is they very rapidly A-B test it. So they give it to all of the people that have personalities like me, um, and they see, well, OK, are those people clicking the image we've presented? Yes, great. Um, from a military perspective, what they're doing then is reinforcing success, pouring more um, money, in the case of uh, Cambridge Analytica, in this case, more effort, into showing the image that is most likely to get the click-throughs on Netflix. And so you can very rapidly pivot to make sure that the information you're presenting is having the effect that you were setting out to. One of the ways in which P.W. Singer has described this is as, as weaponized experimentation. Think about what Cambridge Analytica were doing. They, they ran some six million different adverts, six million different adverts as part of the Trump campaign. Each of them online would have been personally tailored, not only to present you with a particular message that was likely to have the most effect, but to present it with the image that was most likely to have that effect on you. Now, let me back up a slide. This guy in the, in the bottom right is Dominic Cummings. Uh, Dominic Cummings headed up the Vote Leave campaign in the UK, and I had the, uh, I think, privilege, though depending on your politics, you might see that differently, uh, of sharing a stage with him at a major behavioural sciences festival in the UK a couple of years ago. And what Dominic said to the audience, bear in mind this, this audience is an audience of, uh, of those working in the marketing industry, and he said, I didn't employ anybody like you, some 200 of them in the audience, I didn't employ anyone like you to do my political marketing. I wasn't interested in anyone with a BA in gender studies. I didn't want anybody with a degree in creative writing or an art degree to design my images. What I did was I employed physicists and mathematicians, and I used them to model human behavior in unprecedented ways and individually target potential leave voters with adverts. Now, that might mean that somebody who would never have voted uh, leave previously was now getting an image. Let's say you're a big environmentalist. You're probably not a natural UKIP supporter in the UK, the UK Independence Party, one of the big parts of the Vote Leave campaign. Suddenly, you'd be getting an image that uh, presented the Vote Leave campaign as a way of protecting Britain's, Britain's beaches, as a way of protecting the environment. Now, um, the point here is that you were, much like Netflix, you were getting a tailored individual image on a specific message that was most likely to get you to vote in a particular way. And they were very rapidly rolling these out and continuously reinforcing success. So here's your first takeaway. This, this is about the need to create cognitive security. If we can... Um, influence people in this way, clearly one of the things we need to start work on is how we protect people and insure against. And there are a number of ways, education campaigns are one, flagging data up as has been touched upon, but it has to be an absolute priority. Um, it's also a huge opportunity. There is clearly, uh, this is clearly something you could do overseas, being able to model the behavior of target audiences in a given country to this level of detail with data that is publicly available is unprecedented. And you might think, well, what if in those countries you haven't got an Excelate or a tower data where you can buy all the consumer data and all the rest of it? Well, um, last year there was a report in the media, and still unattributed who did this, but that all across the Palestinian territories, um, people were having an app automatically installed on their phone that was acting as a middleman, that was sending the data from that phone off to somebody else. Now, we still don't know where all that data was going, but effectively, 
It was a middleman device sending all of the kind of information from your phone, whether it's Facebook data, whether it's where you're moving, all of it, going to a third party, which would have allowed unprecedented modeling of the human behavior in the way that we've described. The ability to start to begin to build psychometric models of huge groups of the population and target, target, micro-target them in just the same way as we're talking here. It goes beyond just social media as well. One of the things that the Russians did was to, uh, and this comes from a journalistic source of mine, it's not classified, uh, but I won't go into to any more detail where it comes from than that. But one of the things the Russians were able to do is use this to find vulnerable populations, not just online, but offline. Uh, in this case, it was uh, paintball groups in the UK. Do you have paintball groups here? Does that mean anything to you? Okay, so these are like high-powered rifles where you put little paintballs in and you, like or, uh, uh, on stag weekends, we would say, you'd probably say bachelor parties. You go and shoot each other and you come back with horrible bruises. Anyway, one of the things I said is that um, these groups seem to be consistently vulnerable to certain types of messaging. Not, this is not the people that are going there just for a, a bachelor weekend. This is the guy who turns up who's got all the uniform and the automatic weapon and seems just a little bit too keen and a little bit too professional. Um, and what they did is really interesting. They started to give money to these groups, quite openly give money to these groups. Now, why did they do that? It's because all of this works in influence campaigns. Um, in this case, I'm going to draw on the pharmaceutical industry as, uh, to, to show how this works. What the pharmaceutical industry does is really clever. Um, it takes doctors when they're still in training um, and it micro-targets them effectively. It, it runs, uh, the, the pharmaceutical industry will run dinners for doctors and they'll fund them quite openly. And they don't ask for anything in return. They just say, hey, we'll fund your dinner. Um, but what they know is that in doing that, you're creating a subconscious influence, a sense of reciprocity, which is likely in the future to soften people's attitudes towards you when the young doctors uh, that are going through training at that stage are later approached by these people. It's softening up attitudes, it's changing attitudes which can otherwise be quite firm. It's why uh, pharmaceutical companies spend twice their R&D, um, twice the money on marketing than they do on R&D expenditure. It leads to uh, the, the over-prescription of drugs that are, um, are off patent and so you wouldn't have to use the pharmaceutical company's drugs, you could, just, you could use the non-patented uh, ones at much lower cost. It's a really good example because we tend to think of doctors as amongst the most rational that walk among us, I would dare suggest. At least we hope they are, given what they're, what they're doing. Um, and, uh, and yet this shows the way in which by paying their speakers, by micro-targeting them, by uh, influencing them, by the adverts that are placed in magazines, um, and indeed by the way they're approached. So this isn't, again, about online data. This is about a... Uh, they get to know doctors during this, the early stages of their career, and then what they'll do is the representative that will be sent to speak to you as a junior doctor will be tailored individually to you. So let me give you two exa hypothetical examples of Dr. A and Dr. B. Dr. A is the really rigorous type. It goes through all the data, crawls through it, wants to know everything about a particular drug before, uh, before she'll prescribe it. And Dr. B, on the other hand, is a kind of fly-by-night uh, party boy who's not really that interested in the detail. Um, and, uh, and, and they both end up as, uh, as doctors in a different part of the world. The representative who goes to see Dr. A will be the geeky guy who knows all of the, uh, all of the data about the drug they're trying to prescribe. The representative who goes to see guy uh, B will be individually selected to go and see them and it will be somebody who's similar. He's going to go out for a drink and have a great laugh. The clever bit is when Dr. B speaks to Dr. A and says, hey, I had a great time with one of the representatives from this pharmaceutical company. And they go, oh, did you? Oh, yeah, I met one of them. He said, what do you think of him? And he says, oh, well, you know, Dr. A says, well, they were really good, they knew their stuff, they were rigorous, they were robust. So what you're doing again is exploiting heuristics because Dr. B goes, oh, I can trust them. You know, if the guy who does his homework knows, then I can trust them. So what you're seeing is micro-targeting and it, and it works. And it's the reason the UK uh, spends over one billion per year on branded drugs when off-patents are available because of really clever, brilliant micro-targeting. Now what Russia is doing with paintball groups in this particular is using that kind of online data that we talked about to identify them. Yes, I'm sure it's presenting them with this kind of online propaganda that we've talked about, but it's also figuring out that you can begin to soften an audience. That you've now begun to get people that you can cultivate and recruit, either directly or indirectly, who are going to have a different attitude to you afterwards than they did before. It's, it's really clever stuff. Now, I don't expect you to read this slide, um, but it's where we get on to the so what of a lot of this. This is a, a, just a very small sample from the science of prediction. That unprecedented insight is allowing us to draw inferences about human behavior, to make predictions about what you will do on the in the future based on the data that we collect in, on, on you, on all of us, not just you, me as well. Um, in ways that haven't previously been possible. And we, in the UK, uh, I'm doing what I think it's fair to say is exploratory work at the moment on behalf of the MOD, looking at, well, okay, so what? Um, could we do something called cognitive maneuver? Could we make predictions about human behavior in new ways? So for example, for indicators and warning intelligence, we have down here, um, 
a study from as far back as 1988 showing that you could make predictions based on um, the integrative complexity of a leader's language, which is basically the simpler, more black and white uh, the, uh, the language a leader uses, um, the more likely it is that that com com country will go to war. So nowadays, can't we track all of the public speeches that that individual is giving and seeing if, see if we can draw inferences about... Um, what they might be planning to do to a particular country in the way in which their speech is changing. But we can go much further. You see here, um, predicting the big five personality traits based on eye movements. Um, that's a study done at an Australian university. They put uh, the equivalent, it wasn't Google Glasses, it was a German equivalent, but for the sake of the conversation, Google Glasses gets across what it was. They gave participants these Google Glasses and they said, hey, um, just walk from here to the shop, buy something and, and come back based purely on the directions of their eye movements um, through those Google Glasses, they were able to build those personality models much in the way that Cambridge Analytica did using, uh, using social media data. They were measuring a particular input, in this case the way in which your eyes were moving, uh, they were looking at the output, the behaviour, and then they were um, doing some computational modelling to make predictions about what you might do in the future, building these personality models. Now, again, uh, Imagine if we can, tra 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 we can track the eye movements of individuals uh, who are regularly appearing in public. Again, really interesting. I'll give you one more example um, before we move on, which is uh, somewhere on there. There's a um, study that a friend of mine, Robin Dunbar, was uh, heavily involved in, which looks at the way you can model a um, social network based on either credit card data or um, social media data. And uh, um, what you would do is you would establish the the network around an individual human being, their, their social network structure. And what's interesting is that doesn't change over time. So uh, let's say uh, the chap at the front here has a, um, has a uh, when he's 18, he has a, a social network structure where he has one very close friend, three slightly more distant, four slightly more distant, and that, that structure broadly doesn't change throughout an individual's life, which I think is fascinating in and of itself. What changes is the people in that structure. You tend to have broadly the same social network structure throughout. Think of that from an intelligence cultivation and recruitment perspective. If I knew that from uh, data that I had on Vladimir Putin from when he was 18, from when he, before he was a target of interest, that he had one, consistently had one or two advisors in his network, which are one or two friends who he's very close to and everybody else that was more distant, I can go, okay, that's really interesting. Let's see if we can work out who those two individuals are. So now you've got an in for who you might target. The next thing you can do is say, okay, well, that person, based on their personality modeling that we've done, is unlikely to be vulnerable, but can we go a step out and look at their social network? Who's close to them? And what you're doing is building a network map in unprecedentedly interesting new ways. I will uh, indulge myself, uh, if you'll forgive me, with one more example. Um, Andy Haldane from the, from the Bank of England was giving a speech recently in which he said that the Bank of England has stopped um, relying on... Um, public opinion surveys from the University of Michigan to build its models of US consumer sentiment. It said what it started doing now is buying in Spotify data and using that Spotify data to um, predict market movements in the S&P 500 and the NASDAQ. I mean, it's amazing, really. He said that the, the, the mood that the nation is in is, be is better predictor of that mood is what you listen to on Spotify, apparently, across the United States. And it's more accurate than going buying polling data that they've done for years from the University of Michigan. And so now they buy in that Spotify data and they say, hey, the Nasdaq's going to do this and S&P 500's going to do that. And they base that prediction uh, on that prediction, hinges Bank of England policy and approach for the next few days. Well, that's really interesting. Now imagine that we've got a major NATO exercise in the Baltic states and we can either buy in or find a way to collect the data of what everybody across Russia is listening to. We can begin to get a sense of the national mood in response to particular actions that we take. Imagine that we're in a shooting war somewhere in the world and we can buy, we'll stick with, in this case, uh, music, uh, music streaming service data, but it could be, uh, as we said before, it could be a movie streaming service, it could be many things. We can buy in that information. Well, now we're beginning to get a sense that, hey, when we attack this city here, there was a big effect over here. This, the mood in that city began to change. We're looking at an enemy's will and cohesion. Now, as an intelligence officer, I spent my whole career trying to uh, brief my senior officers on what the will and cohesion of an enemy is in a particular situation. Now I can buy in data that might allow me in real time to map the way a country is responding to particular actions that we're taking, whether it's a major exercise or whether it's a full-up shooting war. The point I'm trying to drive home here is this isn't just about social media. The weaponization of information goes much, much further. Um, one of the reasons things this throws up is major ethical challenges, major questions about our sense of individual agency, what it means to be human, 
um, as, much as, it, uh, as much as it does how a d democracy can function, when we're beginning to say that we can change the inputs to human brains, leading to different outputs. We can manipulate them in these unprecedented ways. So I'm not going to labour on this too much, but I, I think it's really important we don't forget this ethical question. The first two studies up there, Libet et al. 1983 and Soon et al. 2008, summarised all, all over the place in the popular press as well, describes how neuroscientists were able to show that when you are asked, you know, you've got brain scanning on functional magnetic resonance imaging in this case for those that are interested, but you're brain scanning and, uh, and you're told that a light is going to come on, on the screen, you've got to press button A, you choose to press button A or button B in response. What neuroscientists were able to show is that they could predict based on neural activity which button you were going to press before you knew which button you were going to press. Not only that, they could do it seven seconds before, and allowing for measurement um, error is perhaps as much as 10 seconds. Now, that's all a bit geeky and neuroscience-y. So what, you might say? The point is, it was showing that, um, that much of our behavior is, um, is pre-conscious. It's not fully under our conscious control. And that's the reason that we can use that unprecedented amount of data living in the global panopticon to make predictions that are better as to what you might do than often you can do yourself. We are not great guides to our own behavior. Don't believe me? There's more. Jonathan Haidt's work shows the way moral instincts um, pre, pre occur in the brain before uh, we're able to give a rational explanation for why we are responding in a particular way to a particular stimulus. That is, he can show that uh, if you are presented with something that you find disgusting, the disgust registers before you can explain why it is. And then what you do is you come up with a post-fact narrative. Uh, Michael Gazzaniga, the famous neuroscientist, talks about the left brain interpreter module, a confabulator that comes up with stories to explain our behavior, uh, when in fact that behavior is largely det determined prior um, to us having a story or a conscious explanation for why it is. Um, there are lots and, and lots of examples of this, but it, it, it's, it's really important for understanding why it is that there are such crucial ethical questions that we might not have the control over our own behavior that we think we do. Now, I'll leave the bit of philosophy behind there and move back into the practical, but if that's something that interests the audience, then let's pick up on it and explore it again at the end. Um, so what, you might say? Well, it leads to all kinds of interesting insights. Um, for example, um, IARPA studies, the Intelligence Advanced Research Project Agency in the States, and Philip... Um, Tetlock have shown how for forecasting ability, your ability to predict into the future, is not correlated with subject matter expertise. That sits me back down again. As an intelligence officer, if I'm given a problem, I read as many books as I can, like, okay, um, I'm deploying out to Afghanistan for the third time, let's take my library with me, let's read everything. Actually, it seems that we are better at forecasting often with smaller amounts of data, um, but checking a, a wider series of sources, for example. It's really important because one of the things that you get talked about a lot at the moment is, is the need for explainable AI. Let, let me talk about, explain why AI has crept in here. When Dominic Cummings talks about employing mathematicians and physicists to model human behavior, if you've got 5,200 gigabytes of it, that's not gonna be done by mathematicians and physicists. It's going to be done by algorithms. It's gonna be done by either simple algorithms, programs and scripts, or very complex machine learning that people have talked about earlier. But either way, it's gonna be modeling human behavior based on those input layers, looking for patterns and drawing inferences about what you might do in the future. And then we get into, okay, well, that's great, Keith, but we're gonna need to explain how that AI uh, made that suggestion, came up with that decision. Um, the first thing we need, to, we need, though, is explainable humans. You say, hey, Keith, why did you give that briefing? Why was it you did that? It's gonna drive rigor into a lot of our staff processes. Commanders are going to have to explain why they made the decision they did. I'm going to have to say, okay, I'm making that prediction with 80% probability. And the reason I'm going to have to do that is when you replace my function as an intelligence officer, or at least large parts of it with algorithms, you're going to need to know that the predictions it's making are better than mine. And at the moment, I would suggest across the DIA, across the US intelligence community, across the UK community, we don't know how good we are at making predictions because we don't go back and check. We're forever moving forward. So you need explainable humans before you can start getting into worrying about explainable AI. So I would suggest one of the things that this quantitative understanding of human behavior and the increasing application of artificial intelligence across the military domain is gonna drive is rigor, thinking hard about how we make our own decisions. The other thing you're gonna need is baselining and assurance. I'm working on something at the moment on um, related to the British Ajax vehicles. They have a we're not currently using it. The UK policy is absolutely that a man will always be, or a woman will always be in the loop when it comes to lethal targeting decisions, important caveat. Right, park that for a minute. Nevertheless, it has the capability to do automatic targeting decisions, to do the positive identification, to do, uh, based on behavioral um, modeling, to, to identify that, that an individual is a threat and to target them automatically. And one of the questions we're asked was, how do I assure this, Keith? 
And the answer is, well, it's really interesting, isn't it? If you're going to delegate, or if we were to ever delegate lethal targeting authority to that system, we're going to need to know whether or not it's more accurate in, its, uh, in what it's doing than the human that it replaces. At the moment, we delegate that authority out to an individual soldier, or is a soldier in this case, um, but we don't know how, how often they make mistakes, how often are they false positives, how often do soldiers make the wrong decision in positive identification and all the other criteria before you can pull the trigger. So one of the things you're going to need to do is baseline and assure these systems. And again, that's going to mean the quantitative modelling of our current behaviours, thinking of humans as biochemical algorithms, thinking about the way we make decisions, thinking about our accuracy, and modelling that to compare it with those automation, automated systems that we replace it with. Be that very narrow, simple programmes and scripts, or very complex, um, high-end, you know, unsupervised machine, uh, machine or neural networks, machine learning. So... Um, I've talked about cognitive manoeuvre, what some people have called pre-data. I've talked about the need for cognitive security. Some of the things that I think flow necessarily from that original premise, war is about being persuasive. We use violence to persuade as well as, uh, as, well as the social media stuff, as well as the kind of political propaganda, political marketing campaigns, um, and, and what that means for our sense of individual agency and our democracies. But there are some other things that all of this means. That volume of data is, uh, is causing problems that have summed, been summed up by many people. I like Rick Hughes's phrase from Raytheon. He talks about how we're now swimming in sensors, drowning, for drowning in data, thirsting for insight. Consequently, we are going to automate huge amounts of our information processing. Uh, one of the things that David Betts at uh, King's College London describes is how in the uh, 19th century, the French were relying on Napoleon and individual geniuses and the such like to run their military into wing campaigns. Meanwhile, the Germans, ever efficient, were thinking... Well, how can we come up with a system that produces a kind of thousand Napoleons? And what they came up with is the staff system that we all in this room still employ. They narrowed functions down to J1 to 9. They, they made individuals within the staff structure information processors. Uh, you know, you sometimes think, call ourselves staff monkeys, right? In, uh, in, when we're working in headquarters. You're taking information, you're processing it, and you're churning it out in a new way. We are going to automate those processes now using algorithms in the same way that the original Germ German system tried to automate those processes through um, narrowing staff functions down to very specific roles. The next thing that you conclude is that, that sheer volume of data is going to overcome our cognitive, attentional and physical limitations. Some of those things I touched on in the limitations in, in the ways in which we process information. Given all the biases that we are prone to, there is no reason why we can't hand over many of these functions to more automated systems. Indeed, in 2008 in Aruzgan, the uh, USAF report into an incident that caused a large number of civilian casualties concluded that a major causal factor was the sheer volume of data that was being presented to the incident commander who couldn't process it all and became paralysed and made poor decisions. Automating the targeting in that environment might well have prevented civilian casualties, and I would suggest, therefore, we're going to see it more and more as we become more and more aware of human limitations. The next thing is speed. That data is not only... Um, larger than it's ever been before. It's moving um, at the speed of light. You know, it said that, uh, that if, if there's a one millisecond delay uh, in the data getting from New York to London it costs a, uh, for the stock exchange, it costs a company approximately $100 million a year. Think about what that means in terms of weaponizing information when, when it's perhaps a radar system that's detecting, continuously detecting targets and vectoring on hypersonic missiles that are moving faster than, than anything we've ever seen previously. What, what it means is we're not going to have the time to make the decisions as humans. Our cognitive limitations, some of the things we've talked about, so the, the biases are going to be that much more exploitable. We're going to automate these things. And people then say to me, oh, it's all right, Keith, uh, human machine teaming is the answer. Indeed, we've just produced a doctrine note to that effect. I, I don't buy it. So after um, Gary Kasparov lost to Deep Blue, human machine teaming for a decade, Centaur Chess, as it was known, became the answer. You would pair a computer with a, a human, and they would play chess against, uh, against a computer like IBM's Deep Blue, um, and the human machine would consistently win. Last year in Science Magazine, they reported that's no longer the case. The human is now the limiting factor. All of those cognitive biases that we talked about, those limits on information processing, are now resulting in the human and machine consistently leave, losing to the computer. Project that out into the future, and I think you're going to see an increasing range of, uh, of fields where that is the case, and consequently, I think it's only a short-term response. Uh, this is by far the most interesting bit, I think, of, uh, of the research that I've done on the, the understanding of humans as biochemical algorithms and cognitive limitations and particularly the application of AI. So many of you will know some of this story, if not all of it. This is um, London, the London-based um, DeepMind uh, built AlphaGo to play um, 
to play the China, ancient Chinese game Go. And uh, this particular shot shows Kiji, who was the world champion at the time, losing, um, I think this is on about move five, losing to, uh, to AlphaGo, and eventually he lost the series. What's really interesting is on about move five, AlphaGo did something that nobody's ever seen before. And Kiji got up and he walked out, shook his head out to pull himself together again and come and sit down. Now, first of all, you're seeing the way in which emotion was influencing him in a way that it wasn't influencing his opponent. But also what's really interesting is the reason he did that is he, didn't, he couldn't understand why the computer had done what the computer had done. Just uh, couldn't, didn't get it. And this is becoming more and more a problem. There's a guy called Michael Redmond. So Redmond is, uh, I think he's an American originally, who then grew up in Japan and is, is a leading, the leading Western player of Go. One of the things he does is commentate on Go matches. Everybody's got to do something for a living, I guess. Uh, and uh, Redmond is really interesting. He said that uh, the problem is that as I commentate on these things, I can't really do it anymore in the way that I used to. Um, the problem is that, uh, that we're getting beyond narrative, that I don't have a story for what it's doing. It's like watching... Uh, it's, it, it, he's, he talks about otherworldly moves, the way in which suddenly Go does something that nobody's ever seen before. There's no story to explain it. The way in which we understand information as humans is through stories. I've told you a story today. Every presenter has told some form of story, a, a narrative from beginning to end, that we can cling on to and go, OK, I, I, I get it. Um, back in 1944, it was shown just how much we do this. There was a, a study that presented participants with a square, a circle, and a triangle moving up a hill, and then asked people to describe, or moving up a straight line, and then I'm doing it myself, and then asked participants afterwards to describe what they'd seen, and they said, oh, well, that triangle was aggressive, and it kept trying to knock that poor circle down the hill. They had this whole story. They were just geometric shapes. People were coming up with a narrative to explain what they'd seen, because that's how we work. The volume of data that's available now means that often there will be things that we can't comprehend, that you can't tell a story about. In fact, there was a really good example in the first talk today where uh, our first speaker talked about there being sort of, I think, 12 different dimensions that you could have modelled political discourse on, but he's just going to present us two. Uh, why is that? It's because the narrative around 12 different political dimensions would have been so difficult to tell that we'd all still be here and most of us would not have understood it. Um, now, the sheer volume of data, the way in which these systems work, means that they can map that complex data and they can draw inferences from huge amounts of data that doesn't have a story to make sense and leads to otherworldly moves. Right, bring that into the military domain. So what, Keith, you might say? Well, when our decision support systems are taking information and saying, hey, go look for that submarine over there, uh, it's drawing a probabilistic inference based on all the previous data on where submarines might be to say it might be over there, and we go, it wouldn't be over there. There's no way it would be over there. But there will be times when that advice is right, when it's not explainable because the volume of data doesn't have a story that it can tell us. Like, it couldn't tell us the story for why it's going to move piece here to piece there on the go board because we wouldn't understand it. It just does it. And two moves later, it's one. And I think we'll see more and more of that at the tactical, operational, strategic level as we begin to weaponize information through our information support systems. So what you hear, see here is uh, more of X landscape of human competence. Now, once you understand humans as biochemical algorithms, you can begin to see that in that 150 years since Charles Darwin, we've come to get an unprecedented understanding of the way human can, behavior can be modeled quantitatively. Concurrently, since Alan Turing invented the Turing test 80 years ago, um, we've seen artificial neural networks, artificial intelligence, begin to move up. There's the silicon-based artificial intelligence move up in a way that has enabled it to replace human functions in a whole range of narrow domains. You don't need to talk about AGI and, and us being replaced uh, by a system that can do everything we can do. First of all, we said it'd never be able to do arithmetic as well as us, and it already can. It wasn't long before calculators were invented, and now uh, machines could do arithmetic better than us. Then it was rote memorization. Then we said they'd never be able to do chess. Then it was vision recognition, then speech recognition. I, I could go on. I shan't. Um, what I want to bring home with this slide is the way in which there are many things that we thought uh, a computer would never be able to do that it has been able to do. And in the mountains here, you see art, cinematography, and social interaction, three crucial elements to the weaponization of persuasion. Um, it's already the case that there are artificial intelligences out there that are creating art that humans can't tell apart from that of the grand masters or from the leading avant-garde artists. There are YouTube channels that are entirely created by AI that are proving hugely popular and slightly disturbing uh, with children. And there is work going on in affective computing that is modeling that input-output to allow computers to understand human emotions, to be able to negotiate and persuade with us and to identify um, uh, mental health problems. So you can see that those things are already having the waters of the rising tide of machine learning lapping up against them. And I'd suggest they're not, for, they're not long before they too will be subsumed. 
Uh, let me come back to this. So what, what we've talked about the weaponization of information all day. I apologize, some of my presentation did go over old ground. I hope um, that some of the latter bits have perhaps uh, introduced some new topics. The point I want to make is not to forget that once we can model human behavior in the way that we now can, it allows us to infer what might happen in response to the use of violence as well as the kind of more persuasive social media type campaigns that we've already talked about. That's, uh, that's what I have to say on the science of information warfare. I hope you've enjoyed it and thank you very much for listening.